Thank you. OK. Um, let's get started. So this talk, uh, named From Fun to Business, is about uh, maybe like three main things. The first one is the most important thing, fun. Have more fun, please. This is like my major call to action. I want you to have more fun. Um, and it's also a bit about open source. It's a bit about uh, how we grew the Koala open source project. Um, and then in the end, we will be talking about like, even what, what do you do if your open source project takes over your life and you're like 30 hours a week in your free time? Um, maybe you can try making business with that uh, while keeping the stuff that makes fun. So fun is really essential. Um, that actually means, um, or can mean, uh, in my case, sometimes making less money can help you making more money per hour, like just like do only stuff that is fun. Uh, and if you have like not enough time and people are willing to buy that time as a normal freelancer, uh, you can just charge more per hour, for example. Uh, so we will be talking about those kind of stuff as well as then being an entrepreneur. So the red line through this is basically just my personal story because uh, I basically started out as a student in a university and I was bored. So when you're bored, there's basically nothing better you can do with your time than writing operating system, right? Um, so that's what I did. Uh, and, and that was called Yafos, yet another free operating system. Um, and that was like a, it was a kernel. It, ha it even had like multi-processing in the end. And it was printing A's and B's in parallel on the screen. And I was very, very ex excitedly showing that to my girlfriend. And she was looking at me like a sheep. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it was fun. And I learned a lot about it, and I never regretted doing this kind of project. But what went from this project, eventually we had lots of code, and it was lots of shitty code, and I hit a friend and I was like, hey, do you want to join this? This is really fun, writing an operating system kernel in C. He was like, no way. I'm going to try something new, Python. Uh, and I was like very skeptical, a language that uses indentation, um, but he did his stuff, and then he wrote, uh, he wrote basically the first version of Koala back then, which was a code checker that actually already dynamically loaded Python routines that would check my source code, because it was also ugly and badly readable. Um, to go, to uh, be a bit, little sidetracked from that story, what happened then was my introduction to open source, and that was a Google Summer of Code, short GSOC. Uh, for those who don't know, a Google Summer of Code, who, who knows Google Summer of Code? Great. Who raises his hand when I ask him to raise his hand? Like, everyone raises his hand. <laughs> okay, that didn't work. Interesting. Uh, Google Summer of Code, uh, for those few who didn't raise their hand, is a program of Google, and they set out scholarships for, pe for students to work on open source projects over the summer. Uh, the motto is basically flip bits instead of burgers. Um, it works pretty well, and I had a Google Summer of Code at GNOME. Uh, so I was working with GNOME, and I was learning a lot, especially about Git, uh, Git and Git commit messages, uh, and more about Git. So that really shaped the way I'm nowadays working and thinking. And it was the first time I worked on real life project. And that, and that was way beyond uh, university stuff because much of that, like, especially like how you work together in a team, is never being taught properly in universities. And all that people know outside universities seems to be the Git flow, uh, which half of the people think they use but don't use and the other half of the people maybe use. I don't know. Um, but due, due to this Google Summer of Code, I got involved in open source. And 
eventually, we made Koala like a proper open source project, and we renamed it, and we rewrote it, and out of a sudden, people became interested. And this was really unexpected. This whole project was just done so we could have our fun. Uh, you see a pattern here, right? Um, so eventually, people got interesting, interested and helped us doing this. Um, because a lot of people are asking also uh, last time after the talk, like, what is Koala anyway? I will do a like, very, very quick presentation of what Koala is. Koala, I, I mentioned this earlier, it analyzes source code. It finds problems in the source code, and it also can fix some of them, so it can give you patches. It's like a linter, but it's a linter framework. So if we look at the world of linters, we have lots of different tools, like really lots and lots and lots of tools, and we have lots of ways to use those tools. Um, and it's basically like rewriting LibreOffice just to have spell checking for another language, which is kind of stupid. Uh, but that's how the world currently looks like. So Koala is a framework that allows you to write code analysis, and it gives you the whole user interface for free. So you just write the logic. And what we also did was we wrapped the existing tools. So Koala is one central API. I can take all tools, wrap them to it, and then I can use all those tools in Sublime if I want to, or maybe directly in GitHub. So currently, the code analysis provided is for more than 60 languages. And uh, if you want to know more, you can come to our stand, which we have in the hall where also some of the food is. Um, at some point, we had a problem, uh, a very comfortable problem, to say so. Uh, so this is the graph of the GitHub stars. But the contributions, uh, like the number of contributors, behaved similarly. And uh, with programs like Google Summer of Code and with hackathons, we had lots and lots of people joining the project. Uh, lots of people also only for a short amount of time, um, but some not. And we had a community that was steadily growing. Um, and we really had a problem of we have those great maintainers who are all helping us, um, and they are all busy inviting newcomers, assigning them to issues. Uh, GitHub permission system is totally broken. In case you don't know it, like you can't give somebody access to take an issue without giving him full right access on everything. Uh, also, you don't want to have all your maintainers have administration access, being able to change everything, like inclusion, including branch protections. I wish even I couldn't change that. Um, so with that, we had the need for automation and uh, also we investigated like what makes people come to open source projects and what makes it easier for them to get started. So as for the last thing, I basically took like what I learned from GNOME and what I think that, so to say, went wrong or that could have been better. Um, and a few of I'm now presenting like a few things, a few tips and tricks if you want to, if you want to make an open source project, if you want to get contributors. And it basically goes down to make contribution easy and make contribution also rewarding if you can. Um, because uh, in the beginning, as a newcomer, you have two problems. You need to fix an issue in a code base that you don't know. And it, at the same time, you also need to learn a new workflow. And that is the Git workflow. Usually, the workflows in open source projects are like more complicated than what people know from their company or from the university. Um, especially if you have like a proper workflow, meaning no merges and fast forwards, because you want to have your passing CI also passing on master. Um, so you can, for example, introduce issue levels. And that is a very simple tool. It basically says, like, whenever you see a typo in your documentation or anywhere, something that is really, really simple to fix, something that you can, you can grab any person on the world, tell it to fi who, who can speak a little bit of English, tell that person to fix it, and that person can fix that issue. That's a newcomer issue. Um, and the newcomer issue is critical so people can learn the Git workflow. People can learn the Git rebase. People can learn how they can make pull requests. And if they can do all that, then that's fine. Then they're done with this in five minutes. And if not, then they learn this. 
And usually, like, I think almost every contributor, and that includes experienced people, because workflows are special, every contributor learns something. Um, the next thing is that um, you also have the problem, like, you have few maintainers, uh, and you have lots of newcomers. Uh, at the same time, like, those newcomers, you want them to be part of your community, and you want them to grow up. Um, you don't want them to feel like uh, I'm just a contributor and there's those uh, holy, mighty maintainers. Uh, so what you can actually do is like let them review code of the maintainers and the maintainers review code of the newcomers. Because um, the maintainers are maybe more experienced, but the newcomers are also providing a fresh sight, a, a fresh view on the code. And they, they are a good complement to each other, and at the same time, newcomers feel respected, and their opinions are taken into account. And then they also grow up faster, and they can become a maintainer eventually. And this, this whole border of maintainer and newcomer is just like a permission thing. There's nothing more. Um, yeah, that, so those quotes, I sometimes have quotes here. Those are things like when I ask the uh, Koala community about like what do you like or not like about our newcomer process. Um, we, I don't think we had any negative comments on the stuff that we did except that reviews are not fast enough. That is a problem for us at the moment. So the next thing is same, uh, a bit in, in the lines of before. We can learn from newcomers, like we, the holy, mighty maintainers, we can learn from the new people, especially when it comes, for example, to the newcomer workflow. Like, how did this go for you? Did you have any problems? Where are your problems? It's like, you can usability test your newcomer workflow, and then you can make it very easy to contribute, and then you can get more contributions. It's basically as simple as that. So you have to iterate, and you have to think like a startup. And that is a decision that you really have to make. Um, because you, you can't really uh, progress like super fast with the maximum of power. That would be like having all maintainers working on all important features. And instead, you can decide, you don't have to, to grow your community. And that will cost time, it will cost a lot of time for the maintainers and everyone, but you will you will grow as a community and you will have to think like a startup because a startup usually doesn't think about like revenue or short-term goals. They want to grow as fast as possible. And so I think this comparison is like really an interesting thing and that is something that an open source project has to decide. What is my priority? So eventually um, this became the full-time, free-time occupation as I hinted earlier. Um, and now we're getting a bit into the automation part. So we started writing a tool that reviewed the pull requests of our people automatically using Koala. We already had the code analysis tool. Um, so why not use it? Why not have the newcomers automatically being told, hey, your commit message is not in imperative tense. Or you have a trailing period in your commit message. Those are like the most common issues for newcomers are they have to learn the commit message guidelines. Or also the code style. And this way, newcomers get an instant feedback on GitHub for the code. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't have a demo for this right now. But um, it's, it's basically just a bot that automatically commits right in the GitHub diff. Um, and you can go further. You can automatically label issues if the issue label is in the issue text. So people who don't have access to labeling issues can just mention them in the body. Um, you can build a chat bot to assign people to issues so they can self-assign them without having right access to the GitHub repository. I will do a lightning talk about the chatbot uh, right after this talk in the lightning talk session. Um, and the next steps for us are we definitely want to look into finding duplicate issues, for example, um, because the issue base grows. And this is all stuff that 
sucks up maintenance time. And that you can automate. Um, so th thinking about how can we turn this into business. We have this, I'm working on this, this is all great, it's totally fun, but it's not really sustainable forever. An open source community can only grow so far with love and air, right? Um, so I personally started to go freelance at some time. Uh, problem with freelancing is it's kind of hope business. Uh, as the founder of an open source project, you usually have something that you can show to people, and that definitely works. Um, it's usually being perceived as a very impressive thing, although like it's just luck, right? Uh, plus a bit of like iterate and take feedback seriously, but it's it's nothing really special. Um, so. What I try to do with my freelance business is um, I basically try to make a sustainable business model. Um, and then I, I tried building this website. And this totally failed. So I'm not, I'm not showing an advertisement here, right? This is a failed product. Um, because I, I think it's also important to show things that do not work. This was, for example, like, hey, we're good with open source. We can grow open source communities, and we have shown success here. Um, we can show off stuff, and let's just um, try to build packages that companies would pay on a monthly basis um, that, uh, to, to help companies building open source projects. And like, we didn't fully check that business model like, uh, to the book with uh, some lean startup methods, but uh, I did talk to a few people here and there, and we had the website up, um, and there was no interest at all in this. Like, nothing. So, we screwed this. Um, and I found a new project, uh, a new product, uh, which is um, working on MVPs for startups, which seems to go better. Um, I think one lesson here is, if things are screwed up, just throw them away. Like, that's okay. And then maybe you wasted a bit of time, but that's no reason to waste more time, right? Um, so apart from this freelance business, we were like, how can we make a business that suits more than one person? It's again, like, how can we make a product, also especially a product that is related to Koala? And that is basically what we tried with Gitmate, or what we are currently trying with Gitmate. Um, and we're a startup. It's completely chaotic. We have no idea where we're going. Um, I think it's good that way. Um, it's very fun. It's exciting. <laughs> um, actually, I, I can show it. Like, this was the automation that I talked about earlier. So every pull request would get a pull request state. Um, and you can, you can have comments right in the diff that basically show you how to build better source code. Um, and we're not fully sure how we are going to make a working business out of this. Uh, we got some government funding. We have a first client that pays us for uh, GitLab support for this, basically. Um, but th it is possible to go out with open source products to build solutions that are free, or at least largely free. We are still considering the open core model, which is what GitLab also does. Um, but it is possible to do that. And I'm saying, you can do that, and I can do that. Like, you just have to just do it. Um, and the main lesson is, again, have fun in whatever you're doing. And don't be afraid of, um, I need a hundred bucks more on my bank account if you don't really need it. Um, I don't know, there may be cases where it really matters, but um, in my case, like, it does not really matter. I can pay my rent, it's not a lot, but um, it works. And I can have fun doing what I want. And I think that's more important than having way more money that I would need or can need. Um, and that's basically the main message. Um, and with that, I'm opening up the round for questions. 
um, with the hint, uh, if you want to speak more, like if there's any questions that we can't talk about, we have a koala stand uh, in the main hall where all the other stands are. Um, I'm mostly there, and you can approach us with any question you like. Um, I don't know, and if it's what do you take per hour, I don't know. Be blunt, right? Um, just come around, um, and also consider coming at the hackathon if you want to get hands-on on anything, Koala, Gitmate, or your own project, right? Okay, so any questions? Thank you, Lasse, for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, we have some questions uh, that we can uh, go for. Okay, do you want to add more about the project itself? We have some minutes. Or, um, Are you sure there's no questions? <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know, is, is there anything that anyone would like to know? I, I don't want to babble all day long with nobody actually wanting to hear more information. And we can just close this and if you have uh, questions, yes. So you just, you just take some time for the Wait, first question sorry. to come. Hello, uh, my name is Hanyadi and I have the same issue that described with GitHub not being allowed to give uh, other users to tag the issues or assign to people to fix. Uh, did you try any other uh, workflow instead of like having a bot to try to do that work? Um, sorry, you're, you're asking about uh, the permission problem? Yes. And if we tried any uh, existing bots or solutions to that? I don't know, uh, just wondering, because I think mm -hmm. it's a big issue for any community that you are trying to build to like not being blocked just because someone decides, no, this is a feature that we're not going to implement, like giving permission for Brandon people. Um, so do you know the S flag for Unix executables? Sorry? Do you know the S flag for Unix executables? No. Um, so basically it says like this application has administration rights even if a non-administrator runs it, right? It's used for, for example, PASWD. Pass like for changing your password, you need access to a normally read-only file. So you have applications that have root access that otherwise don't have root access. We basically did the same with GitHub by having a bot. Um, I, I can show you. So we have a chatbot, and when newcomers come and the page loads, um, they have to wait until the page is loaded. And after that, they, they basically just like write hello world into the chat. And then we have a bot. The bot has a GitHub account that has full administration rights. Okay, so much for that. Uh, the bot has a GitHub account that has full administration rights. So, I think I have it open. Here. So, when you write Hello World, the bot can just invite you to the organization and tell you like, here, take care of that, take care of that. We have documentation about newcomers guide and everything. Um, and then you can just do Cordobo assign me. Assign me to that issue, give me that issue. And all those newcomers don't have access to the repository, but through that bot, like this executable, which can perform actions for you, but only selected actions. The bot can assign people, and then you don't have this permission problem anymore. And that's, this is open source at uh, github.com slash koala slash Cordobo. This one. I will present it later in the lightning talks. Did this answer your question? Great. Yes. Any more questions? 
action that we can take. Okay, I think probably they're waiting for your lighting talk. <laughs> that will happen soon. So, uh, thank you so much, Lasse, again. Uh, the applause.